Amen. Good morning. Will you pray with me? Father, we sing uh, the words of these songs, and yet I know that all of us come in this morning in a different place, in a different state of mind, carrying different um, weights, and just maybe feeling tired or whatever it is going on, Lord, and yet we declare these words in faith that, uh, God, you are better than anything else, that, God, you are enough. Uh, whether we feel that or not, it is true, and I just pray that through your word today, you would remind us of how great you are, God, and what is truly ours in Christ. And so thank you for the privilege it is, God, to gather as your church. We ask that you would be made much of this morning, that you would uh, captivate our hearts anew today. And would you just speak to each of us, God, by the power of your spirit through your word, that we would know that we've heard from you today. So we love you, Lord. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. Good morning, church family. My name is Matt, one of the pastors here, if you're new with us. Um, so this, this week has been a little bit of a, a week of reflection for me. Today would have been my grandmother's 95th birthday. And uh, when I think about my grandma, I've been reading through, I have some of her old Bible study materials, and so I've actually been reading through some of her uh, writings, through some of her studies that she did, which has been just really cool and encouraging for me to see kind of a little bit of the, the heritage of faith that has come through my family line. But when I think about my grandma, I just think of this super sweet, tender-hearted, uh, very calm um, just peaceful woman, kind of the opposite of me, uh, but um, she, she's just a gem of a grandma, and I, I loved her. I love spending time with her, and uh, she just has a special place in my heart, but uh, one thing that I knew about my grandma is that she suffered from chronic pain. She had been in a car accident probably in her 60s and, and never drove after that accident, and she had just neck pain, back pain all the time. But the crazy thing about it is I never once, once remember hearing her complain about it. Not once did she complain about the pain that she was in. And, and as I think about her and I just think about the peace that she had and I reflect on that, I realize, man, this was, this was the peace of Christ. This, this wasn't uh, just a, a contentment in her circumstances. This was a supernatural thing from God. And I get the privilege of, of going, Lord willing, this week out to Iowa to see my grandpa, who's going to be turning 98 on Wednesday, which is pretty crazy. Um, but me and my sister are going to travel out there and, and go visit my grandma's grave site. But again, I just love my grandma. When I think of her, it makes me smile and it just fills my heart with joy. Uh, but as, as I think back, it, what, I, what I most deeply valued about this woman was my relationship with her, is the fact that I got to know her. I spent time with her. And really, that's uh, what we're going to look at today, is this reality that you cannot put a price on the relationships in your life. That there's no price to the relationships with those around you. God made us. He designed us for relationship. And healthy relationships with family and with friends are what bring us deep meaning and bring us the greatest joys in this life. But that is also why they bring the deepest pains. That when relationships are severed, maybe from conflict or separated because of death itself, it's, it's just uh, we're, we go into emotional turmoil. Relationships are a beautiful thing, they're priceless, but they also come with that price tag of pain. Well, as we look at Philippians chapter 3 today, if you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to open up there. We're, we're going to really see that this passage is centered on the one relationship that is of infinite value. The one relationship that both informs and transforms every other relationship in our lives, and that is our relationship with Jesus Christ. And when, you, when we look at the, the New Testament book of Philippians, this passage is really the core. This is at the center, the heart of Paul's writings to the church in Philippi. This church that has partnered with him in the gospel by both sending him and financially supporting him and praying for him on a consistent basis. 
And if you were with us last week, Pastor Jeff, uh, he did a great job walking us through the end of chapter two where we saw Paul commend these two men, Epaphroditus and Timothy, as faithful, humble servants of Christ, those who we should look at and say, yes, imitate them. These men were faithful. These men were following Christ at the risk of their own life. Honor men like this. And in our passage today, we're going to see Paul's motivation behind everything he did. Why would Paul go through all the trouble and all the trials that he faced in his life? It's because of this passage today. And it's because of the value of a relationship with God. So let's read the first 11 verses of Philippians chapter 3 together. Paul says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing to you is no trouble for me and is safe for you. Look out for those dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks that he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. If you have your sermon notes in front of you, the main idea of the message is the theme of this book and is that the joy of knowing Jesus is priceless. The joy of knowing Jesus is priceless. And this is where Paul starts off in verse one. He's saying, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in your relationship with Jesus. Now, if you think about this for a minute, what does it mean to rejoice in somebody? How do I rejoice in someone? That's kind of interesting language, isn't it not? To rejoice in someone is to actually enjoy time with them. To enjoy your relationship with them. Think of these words from Proverbs 5.18 that says, May you rejoice in the wife of your youth. It's this idea of delighting in, spending time with, knowing intimately. And if you are married, I want you to rewind the clock to that moment in time when you decided to get married and what was your motivating factor. You loved that person. (laughs) You wanted to spend time with them. You rejoiced in them. There was something about them that captivated your heart that said, I want to spend my life with this person. Now, I don't know if that's still true to this day, but at one point in time, it was true. You could say that with honesty. And this is what Paul is commissioning them. Rejoice in the Lord. Enjoy the Lord. Now, it's very different for me to say to you, Enjoy your spouse or rejoice, enjoy a friend of yours. Spend time with someone you value versus saying, hey, you should take your wife on a date. Hey, you, you should be sure if, if, if you're really friends, you should spend time together. The date or the time is a means to enjoying the relationship, right? How many of you have been out on dates that you say, yeah, we really didn't enjoy one another on that date? If you're married, you know what I'm talking about. Some dates are not great. (laughs) 
But the heart of what Paul is getting at and the reminder that's, that's no problem for him to say, hey, let me remind you of this again. It's not a problem for me. Rejoice in the Lord. Remember, it's about enjoying your relationship with the Lord. This is central to our faith. And at the end of verse 1, he also says, and this is safe for you. Isn't that interesting? It's not a problem for me to remind you about this, and it's safe for you. It's a safeguard for you. Well, why is it a safeguard? Because enjoying our relationship with Jesus, pursuing a deeper relationship with Jesus, protects you and I from falling into empty religious ritual. If we're not careful, we can become real spiritual people, but not enjoy a relationship with Jesus, which is what it's all about. We need to be careful of that trap. And that's why the second point in your notes there is this. Reject performance-based religion. Reject it. Reject it. Verse 2, Paul puts it this way. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. How many of you have dogs for a pet? Show of hands. Any, any dogs out there? Any dog lovers out there? Just because you have one as a pet doesn't mean you're a dog lover. Okay. Here's the deal. In our culture, we say dogs are man's best friend, which, you know, that's a debatable issue, depending on what you think of dogs. Back in this time, it was no question, dogs were disgusting. Dogs were not domestic house pets. Dogs were what dogs are if you ever go down to Mexico. They're like three-legged, hobbling around, eating scraps wherever they can. You're like, oh, like I'm getting infested with something if I get too close to that thing. It's not a cuddle pet, okay? And Paul's saying, watch out for the dogs. Watch out for the evildoers. Watch out for the mutilators of the flesh. And who he's referring to there is the Jews who were following Paul around in many cases after he was planting these churches. And they would come into the church and they would try to impose rules upon these new believers, especially Gentile, Gentile believers, and say, no, 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 you, you, yeah, believe in Jesus, that's fine. But you need to be circumcised. It's Jesus plus circumcision, that equals your salvation. It's not enough that you just trust in Christ by faith. That's No, no, no. we got to go back and also follow the Old Testament law. And Paul had been faced with much opposition from people who were going around trying to propagate this. But he's saying, listen, guys, to, to enforce any sort of external uh, conformity to some religious practice is, is getting away from the goal of the gospel and is not the means of your salvation. And be heads up, because people are going to creep into the church, and people are going to say, it's Jesus plus something else. And if you catch wind or, uh, of any of that type of language, be careful, because that is a drift away from the gospel message. The gospel is good news. And the good news is that Jesus did everything that you and I need for salvation. We bring nothing to the table except our sin that needs to be forgiven. And we get everything from him. Through his life, his perfect life, his death on a cross and his resurrection. That is our only source of hope. Our only source of forgiveness and eternal life through what Christ has done which can only be received by faith. Oh, church, may we never drift from this gospel. May we never add to this gospel. This is the center. This is the hub of the wheel. This is what we never drift away from. We must look out and be cautious that we don't promote any kind of performance-based religion. And this is why Paul reminds them in verse 3. He says, we are the circumcision, church, we who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. In other places, the Apostle Paul says that circumcision is a matter of the heart. It's something that happens to us internally. It's not external. 
It's something where when we receive Christ by faith, he takes our cold, dead heart of stone and turns it into a living heart of flesh that is now spiritually alive in Christ. Therefore, now we can worship God in spirit and in truth and in genuineness. Our worship is what we actually desire. It's no longer an obligation because it's a relationship with the living God who is of far greater worth than anything else. So Paul says we worship in the spirit of God. And he says we glory in Christ Jesus. Another translation puts it this way. We boast in Christ Jesus. If you're a follower of Christ today, your one and only boast that you can boast in accurately and in a godly way is Christ himself and all that he has done for you. Our boast is only in Jesus. That is why he continues by saying, we put no confidence in the flesh. I don't care how disciplined you are, how many hours you spend reading the Bible, how many hours you spend praying or fasting or doing anything that's spiritual in nature. If it's not out of worship for God and boasting in the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's worthless. It means nothing to God. And Paul goes on here and he tells us that we need to replace this performance-based religious activity with this genuine worship of God. And he tells us that by comparing his resume that he once boasted in to his now present reality. Let's read verse 4. He says, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence, I have more. Do you know what Paul just said? (laughs) He just said, you think you're spiritual? I'm more spiritual. You think you've made progress in your religion? I've made more. You have things that you boast in? I got a better list. That's what he's saying. He's saying, okay, check this out. You want to compare spiritual resumes? Here's mine. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew is a Hebrew, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. You want to compare your resume to Paul? This is impressive. This is an impressive resume, and I'm pretty sure this is the origin of the MasterCard credit card commercials. Do you remember these things? They went like this. Chips, $3. Slurpee, $2. Gas, $31. Starting a new life together, priceless. You remember these? I don't know, it was like more than a decade ago. But these MasterCard commercials, it it put a, a, a price tag next to all these things. It was like, it's not about those things. That's not what it's about. And here Paul is saying, here's my lineage, here's my performance. It surpasses all of yours. But Jesus alone is priceless. And that's what he says at the end of that verse when he says, but whatever gain I had, whatever value I found in these things, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Man, Paul had respect as a religious leader. People looked up to Paul. They admired Paul. He had influence and power in the culture of his day amongst the Jews. But then Paul met Jesus. (laughs) And things changed, didn't they? (laughs) Paul met Christ and he said, all of that, all of that is nothing. It means nothing to me because I have come to know the one who is of surpassing value, which is the next point in your notes, is that as Christians, we must regularly recognize the surpassing value of Christ. Let's read verses 7 through 9 again. Paul goes on, he says, Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. And for his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things 
and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God that depends on faith. Now, I know I might get mixed, uh, mixed responses to, to my growing up, but I grew up in the Bay Area of California, so I know there's a few fellow Californians in here, and if you're from Colorado, I apologize for moving here. Don't be mad at me. But the coolest thing for me about growing up in the Bay Area in California, uh, besides the weather, which I still will take over Colorado, is uh, that I loved the Oakland A's baseball team, and I loved the San Francisco 49ers. And as a kid, I had the absolute joy of watching both of these teams win national championships. And you guys know what I'm talking about, because they probably robbed Denver of a few of them. Okay, I was on the winning side of that. And as a kid, that was just, this is awesome. So I got baseball cards and football cards autographed by some of the players during this time. And, and those were like my prized possessions as a kid. You know, I had these, these, these three-ring notebooks just filled with cards. And I just remember looking through them and you know, like, this is so awesome. And do you know where those cards are today? Uh, I didn't even know, but then my parents have been doing a little cleaning house themselves, and so I inherit all my stuff that I had from my childhood. So they're just dropping boxes off on me, and like, I'm opening it up, I'm like, oh, there's all those baseball cards. And I just close the box, and I put it in the far back corner of my basement storage room. These cards that I once treasured, that I once looked at and put a smile on my face, like, I can't believe I have this autograph. They're now sitting in a box in my basement. I have no clue when I'm ever going to look at them again. They didn't have lasting value. They brought this little kid some temporary joy and some excitement, and I thought they had value. But I'm like, yeah, they really don't. Maybe I can sell them and there's some monetary value, but like for my soul, there is no value. There's nothing lasting here And Paul is saying that everything I once thought had value, I recognize has no value. It's about a relationship with the living God. That is the only thing of surpassing worth. And everything I had prior to that, uh, it's not just neutral. He calls it rubbish. And if any of you have the uh, old school King James Version translation of the Bible... Your translation says, I consider it as dung. Or in other words, it's poop, some of us would say. He's saying, all my religious performance, my position, my pedigree in context of this passage is like dog poop in comparison to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. What do you trade in dog poop for? It's worthless has no value, and yet we are offered surpassing value in Christ. And what I want to do, I think the key word in this text is found in both verses 8 and verse 10, this word knowing. The Greek word is gnosis, and this, this, this word is important for us as Americans because we are, are such a knowledge is power culture. We value intellect above everything else and knowing the right information and the right facts. But this word gnosis in Greek is not simply intellectual knowledge. Yes, there's a component of knowing intellectually, but this is relational knowledge. This is intimate knowledge. This is uh, knowing something from firsthand experience. And if we have any Spanish speakers out there uh, and you've read the Spanish translation of the Bible, it captures this very clearly because there's two distinct words for to know in Spanish. One is saber, which means to know information, to know facts. But the word conocer, to know, is this personal familiarity. It's something that is dear to you. Something that you are fond of and, again, have that first-hand experience with. And that's the word the Spanish translation uses in this verse in Philippians 8 and 10. 
You see, head knowledge, knowing facts about God, is not what saves us. And it certainly is not what satisfies our soul. It's knowing him through Christ in a real and intimate way that is the only means through which our soul comes alive. And Jesus put it this way in John chapter 17 as he is praying for his disciples, as he's praying for the church, for all generations to come. He defines eternal life in terms of this word, gnosis. He says, this is eternal life that they know you. The one true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Paul says the worth is in knowing him. And then he says, and he is the one that has made this possible. He gives credit to God. Verse 9. He says, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but a righteousness of God that depends on faith in Christ. The only reason I can know God is because of what Christ has done, because of his righteousness. And the theological term we use for this is imputed righteousness. And it has this dual component to it. It has a one that through faith our record of debt is put on Christ at the cross. Our guilt and our shame has been laid upon him, but his perfect righteousness is credited to us. We exchange our rags for eternal treasure. Think of it as a marriage for a moment. Think of coming into a marriage with a truckload of debt. That you have a mound of debt that you know, gosh, on my own, I am never paying this off. And yet, the one you are about to marry is rich. And you're thinking to yourself, the second I get married... I am 100% debt-free, and I'm loaded. This is awesome. But is that the goal of marriage? You're a gold digger if that's your goal in marriage. No, the goal of marriage is the relationship. The goal is I want to be with this person. Awesome, my debt is paid Awesome, I'm rich, but what's the goal? It's to know Christ, to be in a relationship with him, and that's exactly what happens through us putting our faith in Christ. He takes our guilt, he takes our shame, and we get his perfection. That should cause us to marvel, church. That should cause us to marvel, but that's not what it's about It's about the restored relationship that we have now been invited into to enjoy. And this value of knowing Christ is a reality that must reorient our entire lives. Last point in your notes there. So we are called to reorient our lives around the resurrection. Knowing Jesus' resurrection has significant, massive implications on our daily lives. And it's important to note that, yes, the resurrection was an event in history. Jesus rose from the grave. He walked out of the tomb three days later after the cross. And the future hope of the resurrection is a day and it is an event where we are resurrected and given resurrected bodies But in our text here, Paul is saying that the resurrection provides us with present power as we go through all the trials and challenges of this life. This verse 10 again, he says, that I may know him again, to know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. The reality that Jesus is alive, he is seated on the throne of heaven, gives you and I present power and perspective to persevere through anything life throws our way. I want you to think of it like this way, since we live in Colorado, it's a great place to live, but think of it like God inviting you on an adventure to backpack across the Rocky Mountains. 
For some of you, you're like, that sounds awesome. For other people, I'm sure you're like, no thanks. But let's pretend you loved backpacking and you loved the mountains. And God says, hey, I want to take you on a journey. And it is going to be glorious. It is going to be beautiful. You are going to see views like you've never seen. You're going to be uh, in these just euphoric, tranquil places of being by streams that are just beautiful. You're going to see wild flowers like you've never imagined. You're going to peak mountains that you never thought possible. You're going to do all this amazing stuff. And you're like, that sounds epic. Let's do it. But if you step back and, and think for a moment, and you think, backpacking across the Rocky Mountains, you're thinking like, well, what season are we going to do this in? Because that's pretty significant. <laughs> you're thinking, huh, some of those mountains are pretty tall. That, that climb is, is going to be hard sometimes. Hey, it gets cold at night in the Rockies. Uh, where are we going to get food? What's that going to look like? Yes, there's going to be amazing things that you're going to experience along the way, but there will be trial and difficulty, will there not? There will be times where you're going to be like, I'm thirsty, I'm exhausted. And on this journey that God has invited us to go on, he said, hey, I'm with you, I'm your guide. I'm going to show you the way. I'm going to give you strength and encouragement to press on day after day. And when you don't have what it takes, I'm going to carry you if needed. And I'm going to remind you all along the way of the glory that is to come. We're, we're on a path. This, this place, this has a destination. It's the other side. And it's glorious beyond your wildest imagination. This, friends, is what following Jesus is like. We are invited on a wonderful adventure filled with uncertainty and danger. There is no other way for the Christian to follow Christ and to glory in the surpassing worth of knowing him means certain struggles in life. It's a guarantee. And 1 Peter 5.10 puts it this way. He says, after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ. That's where we're going will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Does that give your heart hope this morning? Is that encouraging in the midst of suffering? That it's only a little while? This life is a blink of an eye here today, gone tomorrow. But we are called to eternal glory in Christ and the living God will see to it that we arrive safely home. And I was thinking about this too. Is like we don't only have Jesus as our guide. We have one another to go on this journey with. This is why the church is so important. This is why relationships with other believers is so important. This is the blessing of the church. Yes, God is big enough to, to take all of our burdens and to see us through to the end, but he's also distributed that amongst us. He said, guys, do this together. I'm with you collectively. Yes, individually, but also collectively. It's the beauty of the church. That's one reason as a church, as redemption, we say we are all about following Jesus together. That's the call. But we must also acknowledge and expect that on this adventure we will face trials and suffering. It's not going to be easy, but it is going to be glorious. And this is why Paul says in verse 11, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. What Paul is saying here is he's not questioning the certainty of the resurrection. He's not saying like, gosh, I hope I get it at the end. What he's saying is I am willing to go through any amount of suffering in this life because I know that it is worth it. He's saying anything is worth it in order to gain the resurrection, which is ours in Christ. 
And remember, church, that this is written from a man who has suffered way more than you and I ever will. And in 2 Corinthians, Paul gives us his resume of suffering for Christ. If you're familiar with that, he talks about, yep, I've been beaten for Christ. I was shipwrecked for Christ. I went hungry countless nights for Christ. He just goes on and on and on about all the ways he suffered for Christ so that you and I might know the joy of Jesus. He was willing to endure it all because he wanted us to taste and see what he had the privilege of knowing. And and reorienting our lives, church family, around the resurrection, I believe is the daily battle of faith we must fight to keep believing. It's a reality that we must fight to remind each other of when life gets hard. And I think if you know Christ, if you've tasted and seen the Lord is good, you would say the joy of knowing Jesus is priceless. I I know that deep in my soul. I know that to be true. But for how many of us is that the daily experiential reality? For how many of us do the trials, do the tragedies, do the temptations of life derail our hearts from where our greatest joy is found. Life has a way of shaking us up, has a way of drawing our minds and hearts away from Christ. Life has a way of making us lose sight of our hope and our future. And my challenge for us today is to just be honest with God. (laughs) As many of you know, you can't hide anything from him. You can come in here and sing as loud as you want and raise your hands in praise, but where's your heart really at? Where's your heart really at? And that's a question that I just want us to sit on for a moment before communion is, where are you today in your relationship with Jesus? Where are you today? I have four categories that maybe you'll resonate with one of them. The first is, do you know Jesus? Have you put your faith in the gospel? Would you say, yes, I believe in the living God. I believe the gospel and I know Christ. If not, I would implore you to trust in Christ for your salvation. (laughs) That's a starting point of knowing the joy of knowing Jesus. But maybe you're here this morning and you feel like your relationship with Christ has just grown cold. Maybe it's, yeah, I know in the past I've, I've been really excited about Jesus, but right now I just, I don't really care. I'm not finding any joy in getting in the scripture. I, I just, I'm apathetic in regards to praying and, and talking with God. I just, I just, I'm just blah when it comes to my spiritual life and my walk with Christ. Or maybe you're here today and your relationship with Christ is just more on autopilot. Maybe it's just like, yeah, I'm still going to church, still reading my Bible, still praying, but it's just kind of just become all too familiar. The wonder of a relationship with the living God has just become like any other relationship in your life. Or lastly, and I hope we can all aspire to this, is are you enjoying the joy of knowing Jesus? Maybe you're here and you can say with authenticity, man, I am tasting the joy of Jesus in my life right now. I am closer to Christ than I have ever been, and I am treasuring my relationship with him above everything else in this life. If I were to bet... I bet there's the fewest people in the last category. (laughs) And yet, if I'm to ask any one of you individually, wouldn't you say that's where you want to be? That's where you want to live? That's what you want to experience on a day-to-day basis to treasure Christ above all else? Because you know in your head that it's true. But is that what is actually manifesting in your life? And so as we observe communion today, again, communion, the Lord's Supper, this is for those who put their faith in Christ. I want us just to take some time to pray and to ask the Lord to to maybe maybe actually write down one of those categories that I I propose that maybe you're in. 
And again, be honest with God. Allow him to examine your heart and then do a little filter and say, why am I not there where I'd want to be? And think of it through this lens. Have there been trials in life that have just beat you down? Have you just been overwhelmed with temptation? Has sin just looked too good lately? Or maybe you've been struck with tragedy. Maybe there's been a loss that you just are having a hard time processing. What is it currently that is taking you away from the joy of knowing Jesus? And just lay it at his feet. Be honest with the Lord. And let him reveal that to you. And let me just encourage you to remember this. When we partake of communion, we're doing two things. We're looking back at what Christ has done, and we're looking forward to what Christ will do. And as we look back to the cross, the cross is the constant reminder that God's love for us, that is unlike any other love that this world offers, came to us through suffering. His love was proven through suffering. And let us remember the cross as a constant reminder that our sin, past, present, future, fully paid for, and that the sin that we wrestle with even today is not going to be what we wrestle with forever. There will come a time when that will be over, when we will see temptation and sin fully for what it is. And lastly, let us look to the resurrection that reminds us that no matter what we have lost in this world, no matter what tragedy we have walked through, it is not the end of the story. There is a resurrection and a life promised to us in Christ. So I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. And if you got the communion elements on your way in, I'm just going to ask you uh, to take those out. And as you spend some time praying and processing through what I just challenged us with, I want you to spend this time to, to remember what this is all about. To remember that this is about knowing Jesus. And to remember, if you're here and you're a Christian, that you've said already, I've decided to follow Jesus. <laughs> I've given him my life. I'm on the path. But may it be your plea by faith to say, Christ, keep me on this path. Keep my eyes on you. Keep me focused on you. So you can partake of communion as the Lord leads you during this next song.